Welcome to the WISE public lecture. My name is John Dömer. I'm the manager of scientific outreach at WISE. And today it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark uh, Root. Um, Dr. Mark Root is the Ivan Runchev. Do I pronounce that correctly? Yes. Ah, thanks. <laughs> Professor of environmental engineering in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Illinois. Um, his research interests pertain to gas purification to effectively uh, recover or dispose of materials before they are emitted to the atmosphere and in situ characterization of aerosols optical and hydroscopic uh, properties related to climate and emissions in the atmosphere. Mark was the chief editor of the Journal of Environmental Engineering and is the associate uh, editor of the Journal of the Air and Waste Management Association and he has successfully uh, advised more than 20 PhDs and 40 graduate students um, and he also pu published in more than 95 um, uh, peer-reviewed manuscripts. And we're very excited uh, to hear more about your research uh, when it comes to the improvement of the air quality. And the floor is all yours. Great. Thank you for being Great. here. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, I participated with the PhD defense earlier uh, today as the external um, reviewer, which was really a fantastic experience for me. It was really nice. Some of that work is closely related to the work that I'm actually doing at U of I. So uh, it was really nice to be able to participate with uh, that really nice presentation and reading the well-developed uh, uh, dissertation. Um, I'll be talking about a wide range of topics today. Um, I'll focus on uh, carbonaceous adsorbents, uh, but I thought I'd give you some other information about um, some of the work that I, that I am doing in case if there's interest in talking about those things during the question and answer period. Um, there's an enormous number of people who've contributed to this research. Um, it's been going on for um, over two decades, and I'll be presenting select parts of the research uh, that has occurred. And I'll also talk about some of the work that's uh, very uh, fresh in terms of the direction that I'm going in, because I think it's really an excited area to pursue. So um, I'll do a little bit of an introduction about uh, my research group, so you have a feel about uh, the infrastructure and the, really the, the heart of the group, which are the students that are members of the group. Um, I'll talk uh, then in uh, more detail about capture and recovery and disposal of organic gases. This is work that occurred, probably I started on it maybe two or three years after I uh, became an assistant professor at the University of Illinois, and it's developed um, uh, from uh, bench to pilot to full-scale uh, studies. And um, the, uh, I'll talk about that also with regard to three different materials in terms of comparing their, uh, their properties and also their, um, how they um, perform when comparing these different forms of material. Um, the absorption of toxic industrial chemicals, I'll talk about that in terms of uh, uh, physical and chemical properties of, of uh, select adsorbents. Uh, that paper was just recently um, accepted for a publication in adsorption. And uh, some of the newer work, this uh, trace of multi-pollutant, uh, uh, trace multi-pollutant capture, um, that's very new. The student is very actively working in that area. You know, Lisa, I'll, I'll talk about the, what we're doing and the direction and interdisciplinary nature of that work, and then a summary. Um, the, uh, you'll hear quite a bit about this capture and recovery of organic compounds or potential disposal, if it's not worthwhile to capture and recover it, um, and the uh, absorption of toxic industrial chemicals. The, more, the newer things that uh, I, I might touch on during the talk is this NO oxidation by catalytic carbons, where we have physisorption and then catalysis to convert NO to NO2 to make it more water soluble, to remove it with wet scrubbing. Uh, trace pollutant capture, uh, we're trying to combine the properties of these materials to not only remove NO, but also dioxins and mercury from flue gas streams, because it's uh, those are really difficult compounds to remove and it's expensive to do so. Um, the, uh, uh, I have a student that has worked on impregnating carbons with iron so that you can have a high surface area material 
but also have a catalytic material such as carbon or other, uh, such as iron or other materials where you can have uh, physisorption and or concentration of, of materials in the pores of the carbon and then being exposed to a, a catalyst, which uh, is uh, pretty cool. Right before I left here, there was a private company called and asked about uh, the properties and how beneficial it was, and uh, I need to get back to them when I get back to campus next week. Um, and something that's really new that I've really been working hard to develop is um, to use these carbon fibers to capture bioaerosol, and then during regeneration, inactivate them thoroughly. Thermally, so you can get adsorption of organic pollutants and filtration of the bioaerosol, regenerate the carbon, and then uh, uh, inactivate the bioaerosol uh, to make it uh, safer and, and have a cleaner gas stream. Um, something that's a little bit further out, oops, a little bit further out is that I also do work with optical remote sensing, and that is to determine plume opacity with cameras instead of human eyeballs. In the United States, we use human eyeballs, and I'm working to uh, replace that with an alternative being digital cameras. I've also worked with uh, uh, LIDAR, uh, light detection and ranging, to characterize emissions of dust material from fugitive mobile sources. And then finally, I just had a student finish up his PhD this week, looking at optical properties of, of uh, light absorbing organic materials at relative humidities as high as 95%. And that's a tough one, getting to 95% relative humidity under a carefully controlled uh, condition that you can reproduce, that's hard. For me, it's, it's a tough one. So uh, these are the laboratories that I've developed over the years. Um, you can see that uh, we ha I have this air quality uh, uh, clean room here. We don't use it as a clean room, but um, uh, right now, but um, we have that as a facility to either use it as a clean room or to do careful experimental studies. Uh, this instrument here is used to measure light scattering of aerosol particles at uh, controlled relative humidities in the field and the lab. Um, this system here is our bench scale adsorption system that I'll be talking about quite a bit. This is my primary lab. Uh, I've been trying to get my students to clean the shelves up here, but I'm still working on that. That's a tough one. Um, and uh, um, I have a whole height hood behind here, which is really quite good. Um, we have a controlled temperature relative humidity room. Um, I had spent m months losing time trying to make very detailed gravimetric measurements during the winter because of static charge problems. So uh, we have this balance here that's now in a controlled temperature relative humidity room and it works great. And it's also good for handling filter samples too. Um, and this is a picture of the pilot scale uh, vapor system to capture and recover organic vapors, uh, which, I'll, um, which I'll be talking about um, in terms of going from this bench scale to the pilot scale. But what's really key for my group are the students. Uh, this is the uh, my current group, and they really are the blood, really the, uh, the ability to be able to uh, do innovative research, come in with new ideas, tough questions in terms of, of trying to be able to get uh, things to work and asking why we're doing certain things. Uh, but they're uh, very proactive and very, uh, really, really uh, an absolute um, necessity for having a, a, a productive research group. So for capture and recovery and disposal of organic gases. Um, the, the issue here is um, we have all these organic compounds. Some are quite valuable, some are not. Um, they typically are generated where we have very variable, highly variable concentration with time. Think about coding operations or stopping for the weekend or not working 24 hours a day, right? So it can be quite variable. Um, what we can do is use electrothermal swing adsorption, which I'll explain in a minute, to capture these organic compounds so that either we can um, re recycle and reuse them by producing this pure liquid, or if it's not a valuable enough material, which I'd learned dearly about being careful about 
cost to be able to develop a technology. We would like to uh, dispose of them in a, in a low cost way as possible. So if you can't save, capture, recovery, reuse, then if you have to dispose of them, how do you do it in the best manner? And either we can use this electro swing adsorption for oxidation or for biofiltration, where we can produce very constant concentrations going into the oxidizer or the biofilter of appropriate conditions so you can scale down those secondary control devices. So vapors will be talking about capture and recovery of organic vapors, where you can have an equilibrium of gas and a liquid at atmospheric temperature and pressure. Um, we found that many gas, many, many organic compounds are not vapors, but they're gases. So we'll talk about how we work to capture and recover organic gases to broaden the spectrum of the, of the organic compounds we're dealing with. And the steady state tracking is where you say, it's not worth it to capture and recover and reuse. Let's dispose of it as best that we can. And so this electrothermal swing adsorption is, is pretty neat. We have carbons that are conductive. They're actually semiconductors, which I just learned about about a year ago. And um, what happens is you can put a potential difference across the length of the carbon and heat it up with dual heating, uh, uh, electrothermal or dual heating. So you can control the temperature of that carbon very carefully, very, very carefully, easily to within a degree. And so you can adsorb. Uh, remove the organic material from the gas stream by adsorption, and then you can regenerate the activated carbon very quickly by putting electrical potential across the, the length of the carbon, heating it up to about 150 to 180 degrees C. It desorbs within about three minutes, really fast. And you have this very concentrated gas stream, if you want, that you can then more readily capture and recover with a with a gas flow rate that's about 1% during regeneration compared to adsorption. So this is where you're adsorbing, and then this is where you're applying power and you're uh, regenerating the, the saturated adsorbent. Um, I'll be talking about, I think there's about five materials I'll talk about. Uh, this is the enclosure for where, what we're studying for an activated carbon monolith here. Uh, here's the enclosure that was used for studying um, activated carbon beads. And this is the enclosure that was used for studying activated carbon fiber cloth. And I brought those with me so you can take a look at it. Um, this is the, um, the activated carbon monolith. It's a, it's a granular activated carbon that was an extruded um, in making a, a a, a one-piece system, um, and that was made in China and then shipped to the United States for us to study. The um, activated carbon beads are presented uh, here. Uh, Carrera is the, the manufacturer for these. Be careful with these. If you open it up, um, they move around quite readily, and they can be uh, charged uh, um, electrostatically. And then this is the activated carbon fiber cloth that uh, I've spent much of my professional life studying. Um, and you can feel that and, and take a look at it. And I'm going to be talking about those materials for, um, for these uh, applications in terms of looking at the morphology and the, the chemical and uh, physical properties of the material for capture and recover of, of, uh, of pollutants from gas streams. And so, for those people that haven't worked with adsorption systems and you want to treat a continuously flowing gas stream, you need to have at least two contactors, one that's adsorbing and then one that's undergoing regeneration, right? Because you can't adsorb and regenerate um, if you're looking to capture and recover the material. So here's the air coming in with the volatile organic compound. And he, these are the vessels for either adsorption or regeneration. We have detectors, flame ionization and photo ionization detectors uh, to look at what's going out of the system overall or what could be uh, recirculated here for the FID. And 
Um, what happens here is the blue lines describe the flow of the gas stream during uh, adsorption cycling. And that's at about 100 liters per minute for the bench scale system. And then the red lines is for the regeneration cycle where we're using nitrogen to purge the oxygen from the gas stream. And uh, that's at about one liter per minute, okay? And, um, and what we have he presented here is that when you're desorbing it, we can capture and recover it for reuse for either the vapors or the, the gas recovery system. And that's the, where we collect the liquid for uh, recovery. Um, and then we switch the vessels. When one vessel becomes saturated, then uh, and the other vessel becomes regenerated, we just switch them so we can continuously treat the, the gas stream for like uh, continuous manufacturing operations. And so um, this has developed for me over the years. Um, this was our first bench scale system with our two vessels here. Um, and we were able to use that for capture and recovery of vapors. And we also developed the, for the steady state uh, tracking system. When we realized that there were many other uh, organic compounds that we could not capture and recover because their, their, um, their boiling point was much too low, um, which is lower than about 45 degrees C. We uh, took that system and we made it into this uh, gas recovery system. And it's similar to what we have here, but we also included compression and cooling to be able to capture those low boiling point gases as a liquid for recovery. And we have a, a company that's very interested in, in actually using this to re replace a thermal oxidizer, which would be superb if we could do that. Capture and recover instead of burning. This is this bioaerosol um, setup that I'm really trying to get going. I haven't gotten any funding yet, but I think it's a really cool topic to remove bioaerosol and, and toxic gases from gas streams for indoor air quality. Um, this is a pilot scale system for the vapors unit uh, when you saw that in the shipping container. I, I lost sleep going from bench to pilot scale. That is not trivial at all. I went from 100 liters a minute to uh, 1,700 liters a minute for treating the gas stream. And I, that was, it was painful, um, but it worked. Um, and then uh, more recently, we've had, this test was successful. So we built a full scale unit for vapors. That's, uh, um, I think that was like eight, um, uh, 2,500, um, no, I think 2,500 cubic meters a minute. So we scaled up, which was not trivial either. And this is portable for using it to paint planes. So you don't have to evacuate the air in the entire hangar. You just evacuate the area where the people are painting uh, planes. And then this is the full scale steady state tracking system. And uh, uh, that's a picture of it in Texas. Right now it's in Busan, Korea. And we found out that a lot of the solvents for painting are so low cost that, um, that nobody wanted to use the vapors or the gas. The, the, well, I've got the gas, the, well, the, the vapors or the gas recovery system, um, they wanted to destroy it. So we developed this steady state tracking system to then um, during regeneration, you pass the gas through a biofilter. Um, and so let's take a look at these materials that I passed around. This is the activated carbon monolith, right? The, um, the wall thickness is uh, 0.5 micrometer, nice solid structural material. These are the activated carbon beads. That's about 0.6 uh, millimeter in uh, diameter. So that external length scale is quite similar. And then here's the activated carbon fiber cloth. And the length scale for those diameters are 12 micrometers in, in width to be able to compare the length scales for those. Uh, this, is a lar this is a rigorous structure. Uh, here, these are beads that could be dispersed you know, for um, fluidized beds. And this is in the form of a cloth that's pleatable. You could shape it in the different forms. Um, uh, to just give you an idea, the precursor cold compared to uh, polymers, basically, with a, uh, with a resin that's made to use those polymers. 
The surface area ranges by about a factor of two to three, going from the monolith to the activated carbon fiber cloth. The micropore volume go, it increases by a factor of three to four. We try to get really wide ranges in these properties to evaluate how important those properties are. The micropore volume is the volume of the pores with pore widths less than 20 angstroms. So it's getting pretty small in terms of these pore widths. And then the shapes, which I've already talked about here. So one of the things we try to do is we try to compare order of magnitude estimates of different properties. And we looked at permeability. And definitely the activated chiral monolith is um, quite porous. It's up there with burl saddles and hair felt compared to the beads, which is more intermediate, uh, loosely packed sand. I'm not sure what corkboard is. It had to be broken up somehow. And then the activated carbon fiber cloth had the least uh, permeability, similar to fiberglass and some type of sandstone. Um, yeah, but what's unique is because of these bulk properties, you can adjust the, their, uh, their effective permeability in terms of pressure drop per unit thickness of the, of the carbon. And uh, th what happens here is that this is superficial gas velocity versus pressure drop. And you can see the, the monolith was just superior, very porous, straight shot passages and really low pressure drop. But because of the activated carbon fiber cloth being shapeable, we can make it into cylinders and to uh, be able to adjust um, the, uh, the shape of the material to be able to have it at a lower effective pressure drop compared to the beads that were packed in that contactor that I showed you. Uh, we also look at adsorption capacity, right? Pressure drop, that's operating cost. Uh, the adsorption capacity, uh, that also is related to adsorption costs and also capital costs. And so we have this adsorption capacity versus concentration of toluene. This is the actual partial pressure over the saturation partial pressure. And we can see that um, the porosity of the activated carbon monolith was much less than the beads and also the the uh, activated carbon fiber cloth, and it really shows up in the adsorption capacities of these, uh, of these materials, right? To, and that'll get, tell you, very, that will help you tell you how long the vessel can stay online before it has to be regenerated in terms of its adsorption capacity. We also did kinetic studies with breakthrough, and um, uh, this is the toluene concentration um, of the outlet divided by that of the inlet. This was just the initial condition here that we didn't cut that off in time. I should have that cut off. Versus T over T50, and T is the amount of time you're, you're adsorbing divided by the amount of time it takes to get to 50% breakthrough, just making it dimensionless numbers. And what we do is we look at two parameters, the throughput ratio and the length of unused bed. And this throughput ratio is a time for 5% breakthrough over the time for 50% breakthrough. And you'd like to have this be a really sharp line, just a vertical line, so you're using all of the carbon possible. So we'd like to have this to be one for an ideal application. And uh, for the length of unused bed, you'd like to have the mass of material absorbed at 5% breakthrough compared to that at saturation also be one. And you take one minus that, so you'd like to have that to be zero right, for ideal conditions. And what we have here is the throughput ratio, not much different, what, 10%, you know? So that, that's pretty neat if, to have that kind of flexibility with the throughput ratio. The length of unused bed showed up where um, the activated carbon beads were, were a bit better, 0.08. Uh, it wasn't orders of magnitude, but about a factor of two to three, right, in terms of being able to uh, look at the amount of adsorbent that's remaining uh, when you need to be able to regenerate the carbon. Um, if you're going to be regenerating the carbon, it's important to um, uh, take in consideration uh, how concentrated that material is, right? And if you want to capture and recover this material for reuse, you'd like to have that to be a very high concentration so you can condense it more readily. Um, and here's the case where we have um, the, uh, uh, this is the uh, outlet concentration during regeneration divided by the inlet concentration. You call it a concentration ratio. And the, the beads 
and the monolith here correspond to this axis, and the activated carbon fiber cloth corresponds to this axis, which is the black. And so here you can get uh, concentration ratios ranging about 20 to 40 for the initial concentration during regeneration. But if you look here for the cloth, you can get up to 1,000. And it, it responds much more rapidly than those two conditions there where you'd have to treat that gas stream over a longer basis during uh, regeneration. So this was, uh, you know, this says, well, maybe, uh, you know, uh, the activated carbon cloth for this particular application was good, but, you know, for pressure drop, you know, the activated carbon beads, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the monolith would be good. Um, and then you also have some con considerations for the length of unused bed for the, the beads. Um, so let's say the value of the material is not worthy to capture and recover to reuse it, right? You can buy uh, uh, solvents at the hardware store, really cheap, I don't know, two, three US dollars, which is close to the Canadian dollar now per gallon. I mean, it's really inexpensive. So what do you do when you wanna, uh, let's say, dispose of it? And so uh, here's the case where, um, oops, let me back up. Um, ah, uh, I'm, before I go and talk, uh, I'm sorry, here this is, I'm, I'm still here. I haven't dropped down here yet. I wanna provide some results for the vapors and the, the gas recovery system, and then I'll drop down to the, the disposal. I should have looked at that more closely. Um, here's some examples for, we have bench scale tests here, pilot scale tests here. Um, we have outlet concentrations on this axis, and we have removal efficiencies on this axis. And the conditions are for um, uh, methyl ethyl ketone, um, or something quite similar to that uh, for the pilot scale. Inlet concentration 250 and 800, and then 170 and 940, it was about as close as we could get. And if you look at this, this little drop here in the uh, removal efficiency, going from 100% down to about 95%, that's when the bed just starts to break through. And you switch over and you put the other vessel on line to regenerate it. And you can see that the inlet concentration goes up to about 10 ppm during regeneration, or uh, right at breakthrough. And then for 800 ppm, you can see that it's a bit more pronounced, although overall we were getting 99% removal efficiency. Those values were good enough for us to go to the pilot scale here, and you can see it doesn't look like textbook conditions here. Nowhere near what we had uh, when we were in the, the laboratory with carefully controlled conditions, right? You can see here there's some cases where it spiked up for concentrations up to about 150 ppm when the inlet was at 940. Um, a little bit more challenging at these higher concentrations, but um, um, it was good enough for us to be able to continue on to go to the full scale. But the difficulty of going from bench to pilot it, very little is available in the literature from what we could find, and uh, that was tough. It was tough for us to, to do that scale up. Um, so for the gas recovery, still with this red circle up on the top, um, here's the case where we're uh, adsorbing, and this is the adsorption cycles, this is the regen cycle, and you can see uh, there was some offset here with the, the zero, but then after that, it looks like it settled down, and this is where you got breakthrough each time to show that it can operate consistently. And then during regeneration, we got up to like 95% by volume of the organic gas, 95%. And then it's much easier to condense to recover, and it costs much less energy, much less operating costs, um, which, uh, for us, we were thrilled to be able to get those kind of, kind of results. So now for the disposal side. Um, we, we found that there were many compounds emitted into the atmosphere. They're considered to be uh, toxic, but they're not worthwhile to recover and reuse because of energy and being operating costs and capital costs. So we worked on the steady state tracking system to either produce 500 ppm to go into a biofilter or 5,000 ppm to go to an oxidizer to stay below the lower explosive limit for safety reasons, but then also to minimize auxiliary fuel requirements 
to burn the material. And the trick here is, as I had mentioned before, the concentration of the contaminant that you want to capture can be highly variable. And notice these are days, one, two, three, four, five, where we'd only have like one event where you'd have to capture and recover the material from the gas stream, right? So um, there's other times we've got three or four events, right? So it's highly variable. And so um, what we thought we'd do is to use this adsorbent to adsorb the material, but then during regeneration, regenerated a very carefully controlled condition so that you can more readily dispose of it with, the, with a much smaller uh, device. And so for the 500 ppm that we want to feed to a biofilter during regeneration, um, we were like right on, except for right in this beginning here where you had a little upset trying to stabilize. But very close conditions. Um, I think we were within a couple of percent, something like that, for uh, measured versus the set point. If, it's always good to compare modeled with experimental results for closure. And here's the case where this was the uh, outlet uh, amount of MEK that was desorbed experimentally. And this is what we were able to determine for MEK that's at, uh, adsorbed onto the carbon, assuming um, thermal equilibrium for the activated carbon fibers which are at 12 micrometers, very small, thin materials. And it's pretty good, not bad, um, but we, you know, we were underrepresented uh, here, and then with the model, we overpredicted, and we think it's due to temperature measurement, but we don't, we don't know for sure. When we go to the 5,000 ppm case, it's still quite good. We're able to do that. Looks really good for the concentration set point and measured. We get a bigger deviation here between what was measured and what we um, uh, would model for assuming that the adsorbate was in uh, thermal equilibrium using the dubinin radutskovich equation with that of the, the carbon. But uh, we, uh, it was good enough to publish. Um, in, so what we did is we went and we figured, well, this is neat, but how much energy are we consuming? Right? And, um, and where is it being consumed? And so this is a pie chart for the electrical energy that's consumed for the 500 ppm regeneration compared to the case with 5,000 ppm regeneration. And 75% um, of the energy was going to heating up the air, right? 75%, and that's it, hey, you know, we, we really need to look at that much more closely. Um, the, the, here's some examples. The fittings were 3%, the heat of absorption and the liquid MEK specific heat 3%. These are all pretty small terms. You know, convection was the second largest one. That's, that's a lot unless you can recover that heat. For the 5,000 ppm case, that's better, but 50% still is large unless you recover that energy. And the only reason why this was uh, so much smaller is because we regenerated over a shorter time period. Right? There's less carrier gas consumed during regeneration. And so that really um, said, you know, we really have to look at how this is going to be able to be operated to reduce these uh, energy requirements so we're not just heating up the carrier gas during regeneration. Okay. Um, the, the next topic I thought would be pretty neat to talk about is uh, I worked with some people to look at different carbon materials to capture toxic materials, and then to compare that to a more benign material such as uh, butane. Um, and this was for the use when considering uh, gas masks, right, to capture toxic gases like what we're hearing poten potentially occurring in Syria. This would be for uh, controlling or protecting troops from um, toxic gas, or if you happen to be a, uh, let's say a fireman and you're, you're looking to uh, resolve an issue with a tank truck that had uh, spilled over and there were toxic gases in the air that you needed to wear uh, protection. And so here we've got this uh, nanofibers made by eSpin. I've got that one here. You can open it up and uh, compare that one. Um, this one here, if you take a look at the this is 100 micrometer, and this is 5 micrometers. So this is less than a micro, well, anywhere from less than a micrometer up to maybe 2 micrometer in diameter for these fibers, 
right? Um, we have granular activated carbon, that's Calgon BPL. That's um, um, very commercially available. Um, and we have the microfibers as the activated carbon fiber cloth. Um, I don't have the cost for the nanofibers. The granular activated carbon comes in at about uh, one to two dollars a kilogram. The, the activated carbon fiber cloth comes in at about four to five hundred dollars per kilogram. So this stuff has to be really good compared to let's say the granular activated carbon to overcome a capital costs, right? You know, especially when you go in the pilot and full scale. And so here I'm comparing the different properties of the, the three, the, the nanofiber, the Calgon BPL, and the activated carbon fiber cloth. Um, you can see there's about a factor two difference in micropore volume. Microporosity, they're all three are almost 100%, you know, 90 to 100% microporous, really small pores, high absorption uh, potentials for that. The micropore widths, Pretty similar, seven to eight uh, angstroms. And surface areas uh, range within about a factor of two difference. And pointing out here, this is 700 compared to 1200, you'd think, oh, all the surface area uh, that you'd have, you know, the activated carbon fiber cloth would be more beneficial for absorbing uh, different pollutants. If you take a look at the, the carbon content, uh, you know, 80, 82 to 95 for bulk, and if you look at just surface uh, composition, it's, yeah, it's not so much different, 86 to 95. Um, and then these are duplicate tests here with the parentheses. What's really different though, is the, the nitrogen content for the, uh, the nanofibers and also the oxygen content in terms of uh, composition of the, uh, um, the nanofibers compared to the BPL and the activated carbon fiber cloth. And so here's the first test where we just looked at N-butane being this alkane, fairly nondescript uh, material, uh, not having a lot of potential for chemisorption. And boy, the activated carbon uh, fiber cloth looked pretty darn good in terms of absorption capacity versus concentration compared to the, the BPL and the, active, the, the nanofiber. I wish we had more data in this region here because I think the nanofibers might be superior to the um, activated carbon fiber cloth at dilute concentrations, which is where a lot of the work occurs. These really dilute values. But if you look at SO2 adsorption, this is the nanofibers with the high nitrogen content. And here's the activated carbon fiber cloth and the BPL. Uh, we did see some hysteresis, which says that there might be some chemisorption going on there, but a far superior absorption capacity for this toxic gas, sulfur dioxide, right? And we did a, a bunch of tests looking at the nitrogen, oxygen, uh, ni nitrogen, hydrogen, nitrogen, hydrogen groups um, that could contribute to uh, increasing the absorption of the SO2 with the, the carbon surface for the nanofibers. Um, when we looked at hydrogen cyanide, which you gotta be careful, it's really toxic stuff. This was done in a completely different lab. I did not have my students do this. It was, uh, it was in a Department of Defense lab. You can see that the absorption capacity for the nanofibers is just dominant just absolutely dominant, even at these really low concentrations here, which I wish we had more data in this region, compared to the BPL and the activated carbon fiber cloth. And so if you're looking at troop protection, where you're looking at one event, um, you know, these nanofibers are, are incredible, you know, in terms of uh, protection in case if there is um, uh, releases of, of toxic uh, materials. Okay. Um, so, the, what I'm going to be talking about now is things that I'm doing that's really quite new. Um, and uh, to give you an idea about some of the cool things you can do when, when you're networking, from when you meet people at your universities, like the students are doing now, and then you go out, and then you can collaborate with your colleagues later on. Um, I have a, a grant looking at primarily removal of NO, because the PhD committee said focus on NO. But we're also looking at removal of uh, dioxins and furans and also um, 
uh, mercury from flue gas streams, trying to remove it simultaneously, right? And um, this would be like for coal combustion, where you have mercury and coal, and uh, you do get slight amounts of dioxin and furans formed, and you get the NOx, right? Because of thermal, primarily thermal and, and fuel NOx uh, formation. Um, we're doing the NO removal at U of I, but uh, we're working with National, Na National Central University in Taiwan and National Taipei University of Technology also in Taiwan, because they have labs set up just to do the dioxin and furans and the mercury work. And so what we're hypothesizing is this NO oxidation will be, physical, uh, will be a physical absorbent and then that carbon will act as a catalyst to help form NO2 from the NO. And that's been worked on for, for quite a while. And we're working to improve it and to understand the mechanisms better. The idea here is to convert the NO to a more soluble material, NO2, that can be used to remove, um, that, uh, use a wet scrubber to remove that material from the gas stream. For the mercury, we're thinking, well, you could have physical absorption. Uh, you could have chemical absorption, um, and you it could act as a catalyst support to, let's say, convert elemental mercury to mercury chloride or ionic mercury. So not only, let's say, remove it from the gas stream, but possibly convert it to a material that's more soluble, the ionic mercury, once again to be removed in a wet scrubber. And then here with the dioxins and furans, that's a tough one. Man, I can't believe I've spent time in their labs and it's really tough to do that work. We're thinking physical absorption, but we've also seen some preliminary results where it's looking like there's destruction going on, but it's really hard because there's so many isomers of, of the uh, dioxins and the furans. Um, it gets really complicated. And so uh, here, the idea is that we'd have this NO, it would absorb, and then you'd have uh, NO reacting with oxygen uh, to form NO2 adsorbed, and then that NO2 would be uh, released, that could be used. Um, a very slow reaction would just have the NO reacting with the oxygen to form NO2. So we're trying to get this to go fast enough so that it can be used um, in practice for uh, you know, control applications. For the mercury here, this is describing the, the uh, fraction of the mercury removed versus time for different sizes of granular activated carbon uh, because the surface properties are very important, especially for kinetics of absorption, kinetics of absorption. And then the last one is where uh, we're uh, treating the carbon with different functional groups uh, for different pore widths to see whether we can have these functional groups interact with the dioxins and furans to enhance adsorption and to destroy them, uh, which would be great, instead of adsorbing and then uh, making our carbons uh, uh, hazardous materials. So, and so we're really pushing it. We're looking at the physical structure of the carbons, their pore widths. We can tailor that between I think, well, it depends on how you look at it, anywhere from about six angstroms up to about 25 angstroms. And then we're also looking at working with different um, uh, surface chemistry to not only try to enhance adsorption with these narrow pores, but then also concentrate the material in the pores so that they are more readily interacting with either a catalyst or a surface compound. But can we do it? That's the question. And so um, the, uh, um, the mercury, uh, what we're looking to do here is the uh, physical adsorption and possibly chemical adsorption uh, with the uh, mercury, applying it toward uh, activated carbon injection. So very short time periods. Uh, if you have seconds, you're lucky uh, with the uh, uh, um, activated carbon injection, and we're working with Professor Sing Cheng Chi, who's, he, he can do elemental mercury, um, he can do uh, ionic mercury generation, and also testing of the absorption capacities. And for the dioxins, we're looking for uh, it being an adsorbent, but then also being able to hopefully destroy the materials. 
And we're doing that with Professor Mu Bin Chang at National Central University. And uh, he, since he's gone there, he's developed an entire lab with a high resolution mass spec. He has a whole room just for this mass spec. And um, he had to get a huge loan to be able to buy this piece of equipment. And in Taiwan, they, they burn a lot of their, their municipal waste for resource recovery, for steam and electricity, where the potential for uh, dioxin and furan production is much greater. So um, he's going to be contributing um, with these tests. And so what we have done is um, we've done the NO test, and we've selected out these different materials that we think would be most appropriate for NO removal. And then we're looking to modify those. And then we're going to these labs to look at uh, um, uh, the removal or conversion of the mercury and then the dioxins and the furans. And so we're thinking that uh, physical absorption with catalysis is going to be the big one for the NO oxidation. The mercury, probably chemical absorption, so see we can treat the, the materials with like sulfur or bromine. Um, and then the PCDFs uh, adsorption with catalysis. Um, we're um, this point here is really getting worked on very hard because my graduate students PhD committee said you need to do that one very rigorously. So he's, he's working on that one. And these are more screening tests to see how well they can work. Um, and so we're looking for a high microporous material to concentrate the, mater the, the pollutants in the pores, get it more concentrated than in the bulk gas. Um, and if we also have a total pore volume, uh, a large total pore volume, that would be great, but I think this microporosity is going to be the, the big one so that we can get those pollutants cl more closely oriented toward, let's say, surface functional groups or a catalyst to adsorb or convert the material to something that we can capture more readily or less toxic. Um, the oxygen functional groups, um, uh, we've seen that they're increased uh, with NO oxidation, and, um, but the thing there is we, we, we want to be careful because if we oxidize the surface, we're concerned about competitive absorption of water vapor, just flooding our pores, flooding our surface area with water vapor, and uh, so we're really concerned about that, competitive reactions on the surface and then competitive absorption with water. Uh, we're looking at bromine. Uh, uh, to modify the surface groups to enhance mercury absorption and uh, iron nanoparticle impregnation to hopefully have those uh, particles act as a catalyst for destruction of the dioxins and the furans. So um, we've shown how we can use these commercially available materials to capture and recover or potentially dispose the materials from gas streams. Um, really wide range of applications, right? Really a wide range of applications. Um, when doing this work, considering the, energy, the engineering aspects, absorption capacities, uh, dynamic absorption, um, and also, boy, I've been influenced greatly on the energy and the cost comparisons when going to larger scales. Um, it just can be incredibly expensive when putting together these systems that can be pretty complicated. Um, I think that the research future for physical and chemical absorption, in particular, adding catalysts to uh, have a simultaneous reaction occurs is really a bright uh, future. Um, some of this work is not only going on with carbon, but it's also going on with molecular sieves. I'm working with a fellow in China uh, at Xingdao University that knows a lot about molecular sieves. And so I'm trying to integrate the, the properties of molecular sieves with uh, the knowledge I have with the carbons. And with that, um, I thank you very much. And if there's time, uh, open it up for questions. The only configuration that we tested, actually, I didn't do the testing. Uh, my colleagues in France did the testing. Let me, I think it's, there we go. Um, 
This is the configuration. And the size of the monolith was uh, very similar, if not identical, to the one that we showed, that I, I just showed you. The gas stream flowed from the top to the bottom, and then the electrical energy flowed crosswise uh, where we, you had these electrical connectors to have compression, to have a circuit. Okay, so you don't have the gas going from the channel to, to the outside. I mean, the, the gas doesn't go through the tunnels. Correct. It goes through the channels. I'm sorry. It goes through the channels. Uh, that's why we were able to have such a low pressure drop. Yeah. You just said you did it in press? Yep. Uh, CNRS in um, no, uh, Alsace-Lorraine area. I'm going to get into trouble that I can't remember. Nancy. Oh, Nancy. Uh, it was uh, uh, Tonder and Gravio. Great place to go for a vacation in case <laughs> if you ever get to go to France. Very romantic. I'm French. I know some of the places in France. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank you for clarifying that. That's really good. Thanks. With your uh, electrothermal swing and regeneration, how much voltage does it take in a reasonable space? Ah, yeah. That, that, that was part of the pain going from bench to pilot to full. Um, I've had one electrical engineering class in my life, you know, and uh, in the lab, it's, uh, we use 120 volts and then we step it down. And so it's maybe. Um, maybe 20 volts, something like that, for the bench scale. With the pilot, we went uh, 240 volts. And I don't remember, uh, it might have been three phase, but then when we went to the full scale, I believe that was 480 three phase. Yeah. And I don't like dealing with 480 volts, especially with my students. So. Uh, we really had to increase the, the voltage because we had so much more carbon, uh, kilograms of carbon, not grams of carbon. And so we had to step up the voltage to heat it quickly enough to desorb it and get a very concentrated gas stream. It was about seven watts per, well, three to seven watts per gram is what we, we were uh, using for our power. And I had to rely on electrical engineers. They, they could do the calculations really easily with these Y circuits. And uh, I left it up to them. Yeah. Um, the, let's see, that's really good. The, um, the tests that we did were basically proof of concept tests. Um, when we went to the base with the pilot unit, I, I know it's this way. I should remember this stuff by now. Um, well, that, this is the pilot unit there, but there we go. Um, this is the pilot unit, and we actually had to send the people back a second time to make the measurements because they decided not to paint tanks and planes at that time. They had other priorities. So they just sat there for weeks. My students loved it. You know, they didn't have to do any tests because they weren't uh, doing coding operations. Um, for the other one, for the full scale unit here, we tested that for, um, we were there for like three days to do proof of concept. So we don't have uh, long term testing at all. Um, but that's really important in terms of commercialization. No question about it. So, so the these guys sit, the, the these guys sit in the industrial facility or in your lab? Um, this one I was really nervous about. So we actually tested it at U of I before we went into the field with that shipping container. So that was used in the field. Um, this one here, I, I couldn't test that at my university. So we had it built by... Uh, I be clear, this one here and this one here were built by other companies. I didn't think a university could build those things, at least not my university. And so we, we worked with uh, other companies that build these things uh, for a business. And um, this one, we went from the results with this to, to building at least the cartridges and testing the cartridges in the lab but we never tested the full-scale system 
until we were in the field. And um, no, no information about the operation. No, not yet, not yet. Oh, I, I can't back up. Um, for this case here, the competitor was um, disposable granular activated carbon filters, right? And the capital costs um, and the uh, power costs for doing the electrothermal swing, I remember that was much larger than buying the cartridges and then disposing of them. Um, and, and that's where the energy requirements would be something really important to try to reduce. I can't say that much about it. I do know that. The uh, Department of Defense uh, person wrote up the report on that one, and it's under review right now. Yeah. But there again, the cheaper cost of these granular activated carbon disposable cartridges uh, could very well win out over recovery just because of cost. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, that's just going to swing through pretty quick. We, um, I didn't include the chemical analysis besides the nitrogen content and the oxygen content. Um, there was also a hydrogen nitrogen bonding that we were able to detect. And we attributed the higher absorption capacity for the SO2 and the HCN due to nitrogen functional groups that were on the nanofibers that we did not have um, for the BPL and the activated carbon fiber class. So we're thinking it's chemisorption with the, well, we're, it's certainly um, adsor it's certainly sorption attributed to the uh, nitrogen functional groups. Um, we did not calculate how much, we are planning on doing this, calculating how much HCN adsorbed compared to uh, how much nitrogen functional groups to compare those, like do a material balance, but we're not there yet. But we're attributing it to this, uh, uh, this surface chemistry here. The second one is a little bit out of the scope. Okay? The active carbon can also use as some material for nanostructure electrode. OK. Yeah, so kind of uh, then kind of according to your explanation, active carbon. So we have different structures. So which one do we think is maybe better for the application? Um, let's see. I know that. Carbon is used for electrodes, but I don't know much more than that. I use metals. I use uh, stainless steel things for my electrodes to attach to the carbon. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't know. I, I know about the resistivity properties of the activated carbon fiber much more so than I know for the monolith or the nanofibers. Um, so I, it's hard for me to compare for that. The, the one thing I would look at carefully is um, if you're going to use it as an electrode, it's important to have uniform uh, resistivity, because if not, then you're going to have channeling of electrons. And I know if you use the carbon felt, you can get ignition, because you have all these separate fibers shooting out. So I would look at how closely woven it is. And I would also look at um, the structural properties, how, um, how well it can withstand being heated and cooled with it expanding and compression with different temperatures. Um, those are the things I would shoot for first as an electrode. But I, you know, you're at my limit for what I can say about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is pretty cool. I worked with a guy with Department of Defense. Um, and, um, and I'm working with a guy in Korea right now. They're bio guys, bio scrubbing. And the issue with using a bio filter is that um, you can have high, if you have highly variable input carbon content going into your bio filter, that carbon content, if it's toxic, could kill your microorganisms, right? 
Or if you don't have enough, let's say over a week or a weekend when you're not operating your, your coding operations, they're, they're not getting their carbon source for uh, staying alive because they generate biomass and they use that. They metabolize the carbon. Um, so the idea here was to take this highly variable concentration and then you can add sorbet onto the carbon and then because we can control that temperature really carefully, if you can do that, then you can uh, control that concentration going into the biofilter at a concentration that the microorganisms would like to have. And then you can do this over the weekend, right? You can tailor it how you operate it so that if you're not painting and you coating and you have uh, um, carbon on your filter, you can desorb it over the weekend to feed the biofilter so it's much more stable. Um, the other thing is that when we regenerate, if you have multiple vessels, uh, then you can have this total gas flow rate be like 1% of this flow rate, so then your biofilter is much smaller and easier to maintain. And the biofixture is that you have bacteria? Is yes, bacteria? yeah. You're getting at a, close to my limit of what's going on in the bioscrub, right? I'm, I'm the chemical physical guy and somebody else, they had to um, add things to let it grow and mature um, before they could do the testing. Thank you.